thank you so much for coming. It's really lovely to have you here. I'm also very much enjoying the fact that I have like a baby star head. <laughs> Just sitting there as sort of flowers and party in the street. Yeah, it's Just making work, there is a live stream situation going on. So potentially you might prefer to it. Hi to anyone who's joining us from somewhere other than this space in Edinburgh. And it may mean that we, for example, take questions from people who aren't in this room. Oh, it's Friday night. It's really good to see you all. Thank you, for, thank you so much for coming. As far as is humanly possible, I would love for this to be incredibly informal. So I will talk you through the plan such as it is. And I will, pro I promise, I'll introduce myself and so I'll hand it to people who are far more exciting than I should ever be. So, first things first. Effectively, the idea would be that um, Harvey and Nick will talk for a bit. They won't talk at you, they will talk in a way that is active and engaging. Right? Good. And they'll talk in a way that's active and engaging. And if there's anything that you want to explore a bit more or any questions that come up with um, anything they say, please do jump in with a question rather than feeling that you have to wait the obligatory sort of 25 to 30 minutes like they usually are in some talks before we can then have a Q&A type session. Okay, so please feel as part, as part of this as to my mind you already are. Hello, I'm Jairus, Jairus Mani, I am a director and dramaturge. I can tell to say that, you know, I was part of the selection panel in so I am familiar with Harvey's work as a concept and it's really gorgeous to see it in this space. Please obviously do bear in mind that this is a pristine sort of opening that you normally sort of encounter work sort of in. And that's, that's okay, that's just, you know, just to be aware of that, like, that point is coming, but at the moment, other things going on, this is like a microphone space. For people who are on the stream, there's like a giant mound made of sound here, I wish, I'm joking, I wish I'd made that up. There's a giant <laughs> mound of sound in the centre of this gorgeous space. So just so you know, it's obviously slightly different from what you might expect from a sort of gallery, a gallery of you know, I think that's also really interesting in terms of some of the things that I'd love you to talk about in terms of how this work is meeting the, the theatre piece. But we'll get there. Huh. Lovely to have you. I'm going to hand over to Harvey first, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then you can tell us a little bit about you and then you can pass it over to me. Sure. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Harvey. Um, sorry, I'm a bit loud at this time, so <laughs> I hope my voice like lasts. Um, yeah, I'm an artist and a writer, uh, sometimes a curator, um, and um, yeah, I guess this is my first time back. Like when I've been making work again for a long time. I just finished my masters um, out in Johannesburg, um, and I've been kind of like writing, doing like, a lot of my research. So this is my first time making television work. But, a couple of years, so it's been like a really um, amazing experience and like amazing to work on like a theatre production which I've never done before. Um, and yeah, just like thanks to everyone at um, Root Market and Badness and all for uh, all the support and like it's yeah, just been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Hands up for me. Thank you, Lolly. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm uh, artistic director of Magnetic North. Uh, which is a theatre company based in Edinburgh. Um, and uh, we work with, although we primarily, primarily work in performance, uh, we work with artists across art forms. Um, so this production of Walden, which we're sitting on the set of, um, was originally done 15 years ago, um, not very far from here, Coburn Street from uh, Stills. Um, and 
it then became a Tory production, which is when this bench was made uh, in 2009 uh, as a way of uh, creating a performance space that's basically in any, so in any space on the flat floor and a large enough, um, a large enough area, which is roughly the area of badminton court, because lots of village halls have badminton court not have to the you know the set of fit was the, uh, the idea. So this uh, this bench uh, has been around uh, around the country uh, quite a lot, but in more recent years it's been uh, sitting slightly more than I imagine in a container in East Lothian. And uh, it's been Fantastic to be able to get the bench out of that container and into this amazing space. And come back to this production, this adaptation of the movie, and as part of that, to think about commissioning um, a piece of work to go alongside it, which is part of this work. Uh, so um, the idea was that there was an existing piece and a response to some of the themes. Uh, in that existing piece, and also to reflect some of the changes in research and things that are known about the source material, um, which is Henry David Thoreau's book about the time he spent uh, in the 1840s, living for two years in the woods in Massachusetts. And since we first made this production. One of the one of the things that's changed is a book called Black Walden, uh, which was written by uh, an academic called Elise Meyer, who was born in Concord, which is um, a mile or two down the road from Walden Pond where uh, Thoreau was living. And she did a lot of research into um, the very briefly mentioned in the book, um, uh, community of formerly enslaved people who had lived in the woods before Thoreau did. Um, and by researching who these people were, trying to find out all about them, uh, she explored some of the, the history of slavery. Uh, in relation to Concord and Massachusetts and the, um, the the northern side of the Civil War, usually seen as the abolitionist side, but she she was exploring um, how slavery had within living memory been uh, something that happened uh, in Concord. Um, but the, that theme is not explored very much in the book um, because Thoreau was in the woods thinking about that. Um, but um, having read the book, it felt really important to, it's like once you know that information, you can't then, I felt I couldn't then work on this without in some, finding a way to uh, acknowledge uh, that. So the idea of the commission, a new project came about through that. And um, it, that is how all this uh, beautiful work has come to be in here with, with the bench and with production. Thank you. Oh, give us the next one. Uh, thank you, because I think that's a really good sort of starting point, and this is how is it that the two of you have found working on the idea of there's something existing, on the one hand the other text, um, on the other hand Black Walden, but also the existing, the existing production that I'm going to you know, sort of 15 years ago. So, we'll start with you, Harley. Would you mind telling us about your process and where you sort of found yourself fitting within that context? Yeah, sure. So I feel like, <clears throat> 
I was always like raising a little bit and like I feel like one of my friends like points to like lots of like different like so many different like things and like geographies like quite briefly so it talks about you know like slavery and uh, formerly slave people who are living in the world of woods. I think he references yeah like India and like Southern Africa and I was kind of thinking about Massachusetts like the geography geography of Massachusetts and Boston and kind of like the trade routes that would have been kind of um, taking place in like around Boston and other parts of the world. Um, and so I was just like really curious about looking at these kind of like strings, I guess, of like um, what Thoreau was kind of like speaking about and his kind of um, his influence on people that came, I guess, like came later um, as well. Um, and reading like that whole thing was really interesting to have like someone's actually from that place, you know, who has like a very um, yeah, like a very direct like, connection, I guess, with that particular like, geography. Um, and yeah, I mean, at the time I was living in South Africa, um, <clears throat> so I was trying to think about the connections between like the eastern United States and with like South Africa, particularly experiences of like colonization. So, like in the kind of the mid 1600s, um, you have a colonization by people from Britain, from the in the United States and Massachusetts, but also the Dutch arrived in South Africa in 1652. Um, and there's this other cool bit about Ophir, who was actually my, my supervisor for my masters, and she kind of coined this term hydro-colonialism, which is basically how um, colonists, how European colonists use water, whether that's like ocean water, fresh water, like rivers, lakes, to basically um, conquer, colonize, and control. Um, and because a lot of like when we understand, when we talk about colonization, a lot of it, what we think about is to do with the land rather than water. Um, and that was just like a really like, like wow for me like, in terms of like, the way that I think. And I guess the way that I think work. Um, so it kind of came from having like, those conversations with her, with like reading her book, which is a really good read, it's called. Um, I don't know what's quite I think of the name. Hydrocolonialism, dog side reading, and a custom house. Yeah. Um, and it just like, yeah, totally changed the way I basically understood the world and my place and like women, I guess. Um, and yeah, I guess um, that's kind of how the photographs, the printed ones, the collect ones kind of like um, came about. And I was kind of like thinking about how to structure them to work. So my first time I worked on sound, so I had no idea what I was doing, like really had no clue. <laughs> um, I used to like make films and like videos and like I really pay that much attention to sound. Like when I got some of my old films back, it's like, like it's, the sound is nasty. Like, <laughs> uh, so I really wanted to like spend some time working with sound and I kind of was thinking about um, how the like, European colonizers like they would have arrived. Um, in the context of South Africa and the eastern United States from the ocean um, and they use like rivers and like waterways to basically establish control further and further inland um, and I was thinking about ways of kind of like countering that um, and so the idea of the audio work was to kind of like imagine like starting up in the mountains at the source of the river and then kind of like working kind of like down towards the ocean because like the ocean was sort of like a place of arrival there and departure. Um, so that was kind of how I ended up structuring um, the sound book, which I um, worked on um, in collaboration with Lisa Azubile or Koshi, who's an artist and writer based in Johannesburg and a really good friend. So the sound work is recorded in English and in Kosa, which is a South African language. Um, and I guess it's the first time I've worked with like another language apart from English. Um, and I guess it kind of, that decision came out of a lot of like critical conversations with friends in South Africa, but also like with myself as like, hey, I want to work in another language, but like, why do I want to do that? Like, why do I feel the need to do that? And, like, is that even appropriate? Like, I was having these kind of critical conversations with friends. And it was actually my friends in South Africa who said to me, like, oh, we thought about working in a different language. Um, and I guess I maybe worked a bit with like kind of Patois, like Haitian Creole, like kind of like Caribbean languages, but never kind of like fully with like another language. 
Um, so that I think that held a um, tool I would like language um, learning kind of came out and um, yeah something I'm really interested in like exploring further and like I'm kind of up to the stage where it's like where we talk about and make it work in English but also like shame on me for like only speaking English like one language like fluently <laughs> so like um, it's something I'm still thinking about a lot like in my practice yeah can I ask you something mm. which is about the text of the um, which people obviously, some people who read some of it when they came in, uh, will put it on again at the end of the talk. But how, what was the process of um, putting that together? Mm, so I guess um, I was kind of yeah, reading Walden and Black Walden, kind of like, I didn't end up using any kind of content from Black Walden, but I kind of like borrowed certain like, sections from Walden. Um, so like the title, like you know, so many human suffer mushrooms. Um, and there's a couple like more lines, kind of like I think it's from the first chapter that kind of like references um, the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade. Um, and then where I made this, I made the photographs in the Western Cape. Um, and so I kind of went out for like three days um, and was just like photographing and across the recordings that ended up um, in the audio work. And I kind of like wrote most of that there in February. Um, and it's kind of like, it's kind of a bit, I guess, like formless, like it's kind of like a poem, but it's like more, it's a bit messy, <laughs> like it's kind of like lots of different ideas, but it kind of like is loosely structured, it's imagining like beginning from the mountains and like working your way, like over the river's course, like over a forest and then an estuary and then like into the, into the ocean. So I have a kind of follow up to that. So it's, kind of, it's unique. I don't mind if I put that foundation on. And it's just that thing again, in terms of how the process might have been different this time around, especially knowing all the new things that you, that you knew about Lindsay, as well as that you're going to have something that's responding to the figure of your own there as something that you might respond to. So what your starting point was, and maybe how your journey has sort of been shaped by. That yeah, um, it's interesting. Um, so I think when I suppose there were a few bits, um, one of which is the bench, um, and I should probably maybe say a little bit about the original process, which was um, I worked with two. Uh, environmental artist um, who worked in a partnership called Sans Façon um, and it's a, a, a French architect uh, called Charles Blanc and an English uh, artist who did the environmental art course at Glasgow School of Art and the two of them had met in Glasgow and started working together um, and I've met them at Cove Park, we were all doing residence at the same time. And for a long time we looked for something to work on together. And when I got interested in the idea of adapting Walden, um, Tristan Charles seemed like the, an obvious um, place to start. So, um, so we worked together very closely on it. Um, and what was fascinating working with two visual artists was the way they thought about things. So that um, the production ended up with, as, as you mentioned earlier, a pile of sand um, in the middle of the floor. And there's also a, a, a stick, which is actually uh, just behind Amy there, leaning against the bench, and there are some stones just there, and that, those are all the, the props that um, are used within the performance. And we had this process of just gradually, as um, one of the one of the things Walden Thoreau says in Walden is his purpose was to simplify. Uh, 
his life to have two or three things to worry about rather than uh, hundreds or thousands. So I suppose we kind of felt this obligation to simplify. So there was a whole process of, we had, there was a whole series of ideas we started with, which just gradually were removed until we were left with this um, very simple form. So that, so to some extent that form, I suppose, was a fixed thing, and there was a, a, a script which was less fixed. Um, so when I started thinking about it again, I'm thinking about um, how this work was going to be present as well. I looked in the book again and found some material that um, I hadn't used last time. Um, which was, was at, is about, um, he, he mentions three formerly enslaved people who he's heard about and whose the, the, the sort of remains of their, where they lived in the woods are still there and he, he finds where they, where they lived and talks about them there. So that material has come into it and it's been really, although it's, it's like one extra page of text, but actually it's introduced a, a really different element to it, which is actually referring to other people, because in the, the choices I made in terms of which parts of the book to use previously, which is like about 5% of the entire book. Um, is really about, is very focused on Thoreau and his experience of being there. Um, so it's been really interesting to, to open that up a little to, uh, to, these, to other people, which I think was part of the process of what felt like opening out the, the f sort of the frame of the production. Um, from having this quite tight focus on Thoreau and his journey from arriving in the woods, building this hut, and then leaving two years later. Um, and literally, in, in this space, Harvard's work is, is there, you can't, you sit on the bench and the work is there, and it feels like that's part of this process of kind of opening out the uh, the framework of the original. Um, so, people who saw it before will, I think, find it very recognisable, but there's, there's also new, there are new elements um, that have come into it. Um, and also, it's 15 years since <laughs> things changed. And probably there are things I'm not aware of that, uh, that have changed mm -hmm. um, just because of um, sort of having fresh eyes on it, but also not. So, in terms of celebrating, it's because you kept talking about opening out. I know the person I had a question about what this might have opened for you in terms of your practice, Harvey. However, just going to pause there for a second and turn and look at the people who are here and sort of open out, you see, open out. If there's any sort of questions or any comments that anyone has, please do feel free to jump in as opposed to my continuing to force these two to talk. If there is nothing, that's fine. I will continue to my question, but just in case anything has come up for anyone, I'm aware that I'm sort of slightly side on as well, so if people had questions, I wouldn't necessarily see them. Fabulous. Well, in that case, Harvey, what has this opened up any sort of new learnings for you in, uh, in your practice? Or you know, does this feel like actually this makes perfect sense? This is the way it's always going to work, especially considering the fact that we're working with in response to theatre, but also like with theatre as a you know, whole other medium. Yeah, I think um, working in front of the production is definitely just a bigger way that I think we work. Um, I guess, yeah, I probably need to start by making 
yeah, I went for work again. It's definitely like giving me a bit of a boost for like a bit of like confidence, like to get to get everything again. Um, I think like because I graduated in twenty twenty from a class my school class, like no degree, so now I feel like all of my work is on a computer and in the library, so I like, have access to any of my work again. So I like basically lost like a couple of years worth of work, um, and then I was just like shit. I've got to like make money. <laughs> I felt like I've got a studio house of space that I can make work, so I ended up um, spending a lot of time like, writing, like, doing research, when I went to my master's. Um, and then, yeah, this is like, my first time going about making work again. Like, I don't have a studio or like, anything like that. I'm staying at my mum's place, it's just like, an absolute like, tip with just like, my stuff. Everyone's like, chatting, <laughs> chatting all over the place because I'm like, having work, place to work. But sometimes it's kind of good, like, you need a bit of like, a bit of like chaos <laughs> uh, to function. Um, but yeah, I think like maybe just like the confidence to like get out there and make work again. Um, I guess I've also worked with photography. Um, that's kind of been, um, yeah, like what makes sense to me in terms of like working, but then having working on textiles has been really nice. Um, I really enjoy working with textiles. Um, then yeah, like working with sound as well completely like shifted um, the way that I think. Um, and just being able to like work like in this like space like, where I'm having to kind of like be confined to like a white cube space I guess like this kind of space has so much um, character and like a lot of like history that's really like interesting in terms of like where we are as well like, within Edinburgh and the train station in the sense of like movement um, and also just like the walls and like trickling down the pipes which like kind of happens in like every like, couple of hours and like. Just really like interesting um, details that even like I was looking at the like the girl who's up here um, and it sets in the reason for that which is like where I'm like, family and family are from. So like just like all these like weird like, kind of like, things going on. So just like really great to work in the space. It's like um, having a lot of like character and I'm glad that this work um, kind of like complements it, complements the the set because I guess that was like quite a major concern of mine was like is it relaxing? Is it going to work? Um, but actually, like, I'm really like, happy with how it is. So, yeah. And more things on space because, again, it just feels like it's super central to what you have been doing and to the, the way that this came about. And I suppose it's maybe jumping ahead and thinking about audiences, but what kind of yeah, what do you want audiences to sort of understand about the spaces that you are you created, especially because you know Harvey, you've worked in South Africa and here, and you know there's there's you know a, a sense of like real geographical spaces as well as like more imagined spaces. So I'm just really curious, I suppose, for the two of you to sort of tease out what space like means. To you, like what it meant by space separately now, what it means with the coming together of both both elements. Mm. And that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go first. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, I suppose one of the things, one of the things that was part of the production because of the, the bench is that. It always, in some ways, takes on an element of it is whatever room it's in, and it's been lots of uh, it's been lots of uh, strange places, um, and it's always really fascinating to see how it um, how the spaces influence how it is, and it's been in back black box spaces which which is which are the sort of least interesting spaces for it to be in. Um, and it was always conceived as being a thing that wasn't for black boxes because it was I wanted it to be about um, I suppose the the real place of Walden groups and also the kind of the imagined space of it. So there's always been a thing about the place and the space around it. And um, 
when I first saw this, this space that we're sitting in now, the first thing I thought of was, I, I really want to, to do all the new here, because I think the, it, it, the quality of this space will bring something really interesting to it. But I suppose it's also a, that is always also a kind of accidental thing because we don't know what it is. Um, it's not like a, if you like a traditional theatre show where there is a set that is closed, a set that looks the same, which is much where they put it. This is always different wherever it goes. So then the, the added element then of having Harvey's work there as well. Um, there was an unknown element about that, which I, I really loved because until these the pieces were hung last week, as we were putting the bench up, there was like no idea of exactly how they were going to work together. And that was, I suppose, exciting and uh, scary. scary at the same time. Uh, but I think uh, I really like the way they, they work together in the space that there's like these three elements all together. You know, when you're talking about about the space, yeah. I mean, to me, you know, I'm thinking about the Icelandic thing, it, you know, with the government equality, you know, and having a say. I mean, I'm really sorry, I haven't read your work. I'm really sorry about that one. So I don't know really what, uh, what the song is about. But why, why was this created in the first place? What inspired you? I mean, why? Could you tell us? What, you know, I don't know about the background. Because to me, it's equality, isn't it? And I love it because it's sort of we all the same, aren't we, really? I mean, that, I think that's, and it was visually love. So, what's your background story? To to Walden, or to the. Uh, Yes, I probably I have slightly missed that now, I guess. Um, so the wall the which is the point where both works start from, uh, is a book that was published in the 1850s, um, written by a man called Henry David Thoreau, who um, grew up in quite a privileged uh, situation. His family uh, had made their money from manufacturing pencils. Um, and he had gone to Harvard. Um, but he then, he was 27 when he went. So at the age of 27, he, he went to live in the woods. And up to that point, he'd been kind of searching for, uh, as many many of us do, searching for what he wanted to do, what how to bring meaning to his life. And he wanted to write, but he found it hard to find what to write about or how to find time to write. He worked for the family business for a while. He and his brother tried to set up a school, uh, which failed. He tried a, quite a few things which didn't work. And um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, the writer also lived in the same in Concord, a village where they lived. And he suggested to him that he should, he was always interested in nature, and suggested why didn't he go and find time to write by going and living in nature. So as an, ex uh, as an experiment, as he framed it, uh, he built himself a hut and lived in the woods for two years and two months, attempting to live entirely by his own resources. Although, as people often like to point out, he still went home and did the washing home. Um, <laughs> quite regularly. Um, but he uh, but he was remarkably self-sufficient in that he grew he grew all his own food and had traded. He grew um, 
He says in the book he grew seven miles. He planted seven miles of green beans, um, and um, he then traded them for these things. So he did. He he. What always feels to me like quite it's quite it's a modern. It feels like quite a modern idea of trying to be self sufficient. Um, but the book is is a, such a strange mixture of it's not an autobiography and it's not nature writing, although it's sometimes seen as being the first sort of piece of nature writing. It, there's a little bit of a kind of how to do it manual about it. He lists lots of things like the things to put in, but it's written in this. It's, strange, it's written thematically, so there's a chapter called Sounds, which is literally about all the sounds he heard. Uh, there's a chapter on Solitude, which is about how he felt about being on his own. Um, so I, I came across the book and was interested in it as, as, because it seemed like a piece of art in its conception because he had this idea to go and try something and then just write a book about it. So it, in other words, the brain it as a in some ways as a, a work of art. And that in sort of late 20th century terms it might be seen as a piece of performance art, even though as a piece he never thought of it in that way. So the starting point for making uh, a performance out of it was this idea that um, that was a kind of logical development of uh, what he was trying to, to do. Um, so he was he was he was well known as a public speaker. He would give lectures that people would come to. So there was all, there was in some ways that element within his work already. So that and Walden, as I understand it, because I'm not. American, but from Americans I've spoken to, it has quite a kind of canonical place in American culture and is um, seen to stand for lots of different things depending on what your point of view is. So um, uh, it's seen as a um, that it's about the American way of life by some people. Other people see it as being completely against the American way of life because he's taking himself away. So it's, it's one of those books that people read into it in a way what they want to read into it. Um, and I suppose by turning it into a performance, I read into it what I wanted to, to read into it. Um, and now, Arbius added his, his voice to that as, um, as well. But the, yeah, the starting point for all of this is the book. Can I maybe come in with um, something? So mm -hmm. w w one of the things that, that um, I was thinking about, actually that, that, la you, that lady's comment about equality, uh -huh. that's an interesting thing about, to me, what this set does is it kind of creates the possibility of equality in the seating arrangement, which um, I feel like Harvey's work disrupts interestingly around the edges. One of the things that I hadn't noticed before until just now, Harvey, was the way that your water pictures are picking up on the forms of this oval space, but they've deliberately chosen not to hang in circles that actually complete or line up. So I guess I was wondering if there's something either consciously or subconsciously that you've been kind of bringing in that's about disrupting the perfect, perhaps white equilibrium of this space. Um, and if so, have you had any thoughts about, about that? Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess like working with the, like, the sound element as well as the visual element was one way of like, thinking about that. Um, in some ways, but I couldn't have a visual of the, the sound work, even though there will be a lot of some chaos and the performances are happy. Um, I guess that was kind of like working on like different planes, I guess. But I think it was maybe more subconscious um, the way it kind of ended up. Um, 
And you know, we kind of like talking about lighting earlier, actually, whether we're going to like weather performances are happening, like should the background lights be on or not, kind of like exposing them more, or should they be off so it kind of like you can't like see them as well, which I think was like a really interesting idea of like are they this is like visible or like not as much when the performances are happening. Um, yeah. But I think it was yeah more of like a subconscious thing. I mean they are like massive, like they are like nearly four meters high. Um, so I feel like part of that was kind of like creating things that are quite colossal because the set is also like colossal. Like when I saw it for the first time in the past, I was like, oh my god, it's like huge. Like, <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, it's good, but then my work is also on a larger scale um, in a way that I haven't really like, done a lot. I've worked in tech, but I'm a lot never like on this scale. So me and Greg, who's been helping me, um, you know, like assisting me like, with this. Like, we've just been spending a lot of time ironing these <laughs> massive, like, bits of fabric. Um, I've got like, a whole work has just been ironing. Like, um, but yeah, definitely, like, it's like, a great song because, like, it fills the space. I think that was like, another thing was, like, how do I create something that is, like, visible and feels like it's there without completely, like, overpowering, like, the space. Like, no, it's a nice equilibrium between, like, my work, the sound, and the space itself as well. Um, and I've got another question, <laughs> sorry, which is kind of for, for both Nick and Harvey, is to what extent is this um, repre representation of Walden a queer Walden? Because I'm aware that obviously you address issues of queerness in your work, Harvey, and also you've cast against gender, Nick, in this production. So where, where are we at with gender and queerness in this presentation? <laughs> um, yes, one of the one of the things that uh, I wanted to do in revisiting the production was think again about the about how this role, which I should say is not intended to be foreign, it's not. Um, when we were first making this work, we used to have this idea of what we absolutely did not want this show to be like. And we had this kind of fictional, one-person fringe show of someone with stuff on the sidewalks and a kind of Victorian outfit doing their, their kind of one man, almost inevitably, a version of all them. So that was always like the antithesis of what we were trying to do. But the two performers who performed in it previously were both uh, were both male. Um, they were both white, um, and this felt like an opportunity to uh, say, "Okay, well, let's." Um, to me, the most important thing is actually about the age, because Dory was 27 um, when he went to live in the woods, and it felt like this part of the thing about the book for me feels like it's also about that point in life where you're kind of trying to work out what on earth life is about and what, you, what your place in the world is, which feels very uh, particular to that kind of late twenties time where you start to go, hmm. Um, and John Updike, uh, in an introduction to one uh, edition of Walden, said, says something like, uh, Thoreau was young, um, but old enough to maybe have achieved a bit more than he had done at the point of where. So, for me, the most important thing is that is that, if you like, the age of the, of, of the person who played that role um, being somewhere in that range. Because to me, I think Thoreau tends to be thought of as this kind of, I don't know, old, I don't think anybody would particularly think of him as being a 27 year old. Um, but to me, that's quite an important element as well. So, the only, so we, we did an open casting call in which the only fixing was 
that the plain age of late 20s and early 30s. Um, but that we were completely open to uh, any other aspect. Uh, so I saw a, a lot of people um, and ended up uh, casting I shall my well I've done it now. <laughs> 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 um, uh, who when I see people Shakarasi has uh, amazing connection to the themes of his um, and it felt like that was the thing that was most important if we take for granted that the playing age was um, met in some way. Um, so that it's, yeah, the, there's a quality about what Shikara brought to it um, that was more important than being a, um, a white man. But that inevitably um, makes you look at it differently. Um, and one of the things, sorry, this is a very long introduction, but I was trying to say before, then when I was looking at the text again, you suddenly realise how thorough, because he was a white privileged man writing in the early 1850s by the time he came to write a book. Whenever he refers to somebody, for instance, um, uh, there's a story about an artist that is, has quite a kind of is a bit of a kind of metaphor in the novel. Anyway, the artist inevitably is him and he. And then actually, the, I think there's probably not, apart from Zilfer, who was one of the formerly enslaved people who was doing all the woods, I think is the only woman referred to, or the only person referred to, um, as she, and all the other, the, uh, the only other pronoun within the book is he, he, him. I think maybe there's a mouse that is it. But um, otherwise, so it was, it was fascinating then going through the text, even just within the, 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 the text of the, the play and noting all these male pronouns. And then there was a whole process of thinking, okay, well, some, some of the he's have remained, and some of them have gone. Um, sometimes they're, yeah. So it's been a really interesting process of actually realizing how really, really male the book was, and of uh, trying to uh, address that. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, look, um, a lot of the research that kind of wanted to show came from my thesis, which was about like queer ecologies in the context of South Africa. So, queer ecology basically is kind of trying to disrupt like heterosexual kind of like binary notions of like nature. So, it's like, it's like what is natural, what is like unnatural. Um, and yeah, a lot of the research kind of came from that and how we can like queer, like the um, environment and that kind of brings up so many questions of like you know humans their position like within like nature like are they part of nature or are they not like why have we like separated ourselves to be this like thing or actually like we're part of every like ecosystem um, and I guess like queer ecologies does that and there's also you know, kind of feminist ecologies black ecologies so it's kind of like different ways of like thinking um, yeah like about the environment so I guess a lot of my research um, kind of um, ended up feeding into this uh, position in, in South Africa. Yeah. Gorgeous. So I'm aware of the time, but I it's basically been coming up to seven o'clock. Apologies, because I kind of want to continue. I've got a couple more things. I know that like, you have another question. So are people sort of okay to hang on for another five, ten minutes? If not, if you need to run off like that, sort of. Please do. It's gorgeous. Yeah. 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 
maybe because I'm aware some people have to finish up, should we turn it into like a social yeah, business? Yeah, yeah. 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 Street market would be amazing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <laughs> my to those people, but just keep going. Sorry, I miss out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.